Hello, and welcome back to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven. I'm glad to have you with me here today for another discussion of military history. Last time, I took a look at the Mischmidt BF-110, heavy twin-engine fighter created in the mid-1930s for the new German Luftwaffe. What I want to do today is begin a closer examination of the campaigns in which this fighter fought, beginning with the in which they made their combat debut. The Omano came somewhat too late to be included in the German Luftwaffe contingent in Spain, the so-called Condor Legion, and so this first test came in the 1939 campaign resulting from the invasion of Poland. My sources for this video will be, once again, the excellent Mischnitt BF-110 Zer Store Aces of World War II, written by John Wheel. I'll also be drawing material from Dr. Jan Koniarek's Polish Air Force, 1939-1945. So now if you're ready, let's try and look at the state of the German heavy fighter armor at the time when Hitler made the decision to move against his eastern neighbor. As I mentioned in my previous video on the development of the 110, the outbreak of war came earlier than expected, and this interrupted the expansion program of the heavy fighter, or their store arm, of the new Luftwaffe. In late summer 1939, this force consisted of a total of 10 heavy fighter groups. Of these, only three had been equipped with the 110. Troubles in the development of the new fighter meant that full-scale production of the new twin-engine machine had begun only a few months previously, and too few had yet been delivered to equip the entire force. The rest of the Zerstore units, though still intended to fly offensive escort missions, which was what distinguished the heavy fighter role, continued to fly short-range single-engine BF-109Ds. Those units which did receive the new fighter were initially equipped with the B model, fitted with Junkers-built Yumo engines. This was a stopgap measure to allow production and equipment of the Zerstore units to proceed while the intended engine, the Daimler-Benz DB-601, had its initial teething trouble squared away and the resulting aircraft was drastically underpowered. The three 110 equipped groups were in the middle of replacing these aircraft with a considerably more powerful C model when they were called upon to take part in the projected Polish campaign. These new planes were nearly 80 miles per hour or 130 kph faster than the B model and much more formidable. However, this process was still underway and as a result, some of the less useful B models remained on strength at the beginning of the Polish campaign. By the time the fighting in Poland came to an end, a little less than four weeks later, none of the remaining B models were in frontline service, and the three 110 equipped Zerstore groups in Poland were all flying the new C model machines. The units taking part in the invasion were drawn from three wings. Two came from regular heavy fighter wings. In German nomenclature, these were called Zerstore Geschwader, and were abbreviated ZG. One group each from ZG1 and ZG76 were among those flying the 110. The third group was serving with a special wing known as Lergeschrader 1, or LG-1. This wing was made up of groups of different types of aircraft, such as fighters, heavy fighters, and dive bombers, as well as others. In the pre-war years, it had been used to experiment with the new tactical doctrine to be used by this new air force. As such, it was composed of a higher proportion of expert-level personnel. It included a heavy fighter group, which was among the first units to receive the new 110. Each of these groups was composed of three squadrons, and these together fielded approximately 30 planes apiece. Total number of 110s sent to the Polish theater was 90. Though this was a small percentage of the approximately 2,000 German aircraft committed to the offensive, these 90 planes did represent a 100% commitment of the Luftwaffe's serving force of 110s. One of these groups was assigned to each axis of the advance of the planned offensive. The planes from ZG-1 were to operate in support of the attack by Army Group North across the Polish corridor. This was a stretch of territory, granted to the new Polish state when it was created at the end of the last war, which reached from northwestern Poland across historic Prussian territory to the Baltic, and included the seaport of Danzig, or as it was called in Polish, Gdansk. It had been given the Poles so that the country would have access to the sea. The corridor was a source of tremendous resentment for German nationalists of all kinds, and its recapture was an immediate priority. In addition to this, it separated the German province of East Prussia from the rest of the country. The Zerstores of Lergeschwader were based in the cutoff enclave of East Prussia and were assigned the mission of supporting a drive southwards from there towards Malawa and then on towards the Polish capital in conjunction with von Bock's push across Pomerania from the west. The heavy fighters of ZG-76 and Silesia were deployed to cover the drive by Army Group South from eastern Germany into the Polish southwest. Each of these heavy fighter units were given the task of protecting the several wings of bombers and Stukas deployed in their operational areas. In the initial phase of the campaign, they were employed in the role envisioned for them by the air power theorists before the war, that is, as bomber escorts. 
The accompanying formation of Stukas and medium bombers, such as the HE-111 and the DO-17, and the opening strikes on Polish airfields. These strikes were somewhat less effective in destroying the Polish Air Force than is sometimes implied in the common historiography of the Second World War. Poles were aware of the likelihood of a German attack and dispersed their air units through a large number of satellite airfields. Many Luftwaffe bomber payloads fell with devastating effect onto almost deserted peacetime bases. Nevertheless, the issue is never really in doubt. Not only were the Poles outnumbered in the air, the German aircraft were superior and the support structure of the Polish Air Force was unable to sustain a high pace of operations for very long. It was in the course of these actions in the opening days that a worrying number of close calls occurred in which the Zerstor pilots came very near to attacking other German aircraft. Some of this was due to the fact that the Polish PZL P-23 light bomber looks very similar to the Ju-87 dive bomber from many angles. Also, the high-winged Heinkel 46 observation aircraft used by the Germans in the observation and army cooperation role was easily mistaken for the Polish fighters. Another reason for German aircraft mistaking their own for Polish planes was found in the red identification numbers painted on some Luftwaffe aircraft, which could be mistaken in imperfect viewing conditions for the red and white checkerboard national insignia used by the Poles. As a result of this experience, black crosses on German planes were enlarged and the use of red stripes or markings on Luftwaffe planes was discontinued. Similar case, typical of the kind of thing that is often overlooked in peacetime planning, but immediately revealed by wartime experience, occurred among the panzers also now fighting in their first large-scale campaign. The national markings of the German tank arm, which was a white cross, was found to be a prominent and irresistible aiming point for enemy gunners, and these insignia were consequently abandoned. Once released from escort duty, the heavy fighters would frequently dive down to low level and strafe ground targets before returning home. Similar air superiority function was served by the Freya Yacht missions, which were essentially low-level incursions by fighter formations, shooting up airfields and attempting to coax Polish fighters into combat. One notable example of such an attack took place on the 2nd of September, when 110s of ZG-76 were assigned to escort medium bombers of Kampfgruppe, or KG-4, a bomber group. After the bombers struck their target and were safely on the way home, heavy fighters swept down to low level and shot up a number of planes parked on dispersed airfields around the town of Deblin, about 90 kilometers south of Warsaw. In this action, the 110 was accounted for 11 Polish aircraft destroyed on the ground, while taking no losses of their own. Luftwaffe's opposition in this campaign was a Polish air force that was caught, like the rest of the Polish armed forces, in the midst of an unfinished modernization program. Much of the equipment in Polish hands dated from the mid-1920s, when the worn-out World War I era gear they had inherited from that war was replaced by foreign purchases or new domestically produced arms. Though some foreign weapons were still in service, a new generation of more modern Polish-made armaments, from small arms to tanks, was coming into use. These Polish-built weapons were on a par with their counterparts elsewhere in Europe, if not necessarily outstanding. However, much of the Polish army, of which the Polish Air Force was a subordinate command, was still outfitted with the older equipment. Part of this modernization program that concerned the air services began by concentrating on bomber development, which had hitherto been a weak point in the Air Force's inventory. This had borne fruit in the shape of two new bomber types of modern configuration and good performance, the P-23 Karas and the P-37 Los, both of which were in production by PZL, the national aircraft manufacturer. The P-23 was a single-engine, two-man, low-wing monoplane light bomber with a radial engine and fixed landing gear. The P-37 was a very modern twin-engine bomber and was by far the most state-of-the-art machine in the Polish inventory. By the eve of the war, the Poles had 114 P-23s in squadron service, with another 40 in training and conversion units, and 36 P-37 medium bombers. By 1937, five bomber squadrons were using the P-23, and the P-37, which had entered service in late 1938, was flown by four more. These nine squadrons were organized into the Bomber Brigade, an independent command under the direct orders of the Commander-in-Chief. Modern fighter types, however, had not reached the production stage. The main fighter in use was the P-11C, the most recent model of a series of aircraft that had first appeared in 1929. The initial model of this series, the P-1, was an all-metal monoplane with distinctive high-mounted gull wings. It was just about state-of-the-art when it was produced, and was exported for use to some Eastern European air services, including production under license in Romania. The main representatives of this series of fighters, the P-1, P-7, and P-11, 
are essentially the same design with successively upgraded power plants and some minor design changes. These would likely have been designated as exceeding models of a single design under the classification systems in use in other countries. P11C was a very nimble dogfighting design with a large radial engine, an open cockpit, and a pair of 7.92mm machine guns. Production had been discontinued in 1936, and the machines equipped nearly all the Pole's 15 fighter squadrons. This aircraft is one of several European designs that constitute the last generation of a fighter development track, which reached its end in the mid-1930s. The P11C, despite its metal construction and monoplane design, was basically an upgraded Great War fighter. It was characterized by relatively light weight, short range, a fixed undercarriage, an open cockpit, and very basic instrumentation. It was built, like all fighters sharing this design philosophy, for extreme agility and was designed to prevail in a close-range dogfight and to operate only in daylight. Armament consisted of a pair of rifle caliber machine guns, radio gear was rarely installed, and blind flying or navigation aids were rudimentary at best. The engine drove a two-bladed, fixed-pitched, carved wooden propeller. After 1935 and 1936, aircraft design and technology had produced a new type of fighter which begins a new track. In general terms, we might say that instead of more and more advanced World War I type fighters, we begin to see the earliest iterations of the configuration common to Second World War fighters. The German fighters that the P-11Cs would go up against represented the first generation of this new fighter design philosophy. The clash over Poland would therefore be a test of the effectiveness of the new aircraft technology and design. These new German machines, the 109 and 110, were clean modern designs with cantilevered structures lacking external struts and bracing. They were built with enclosed cockpits and used retractable landing gear. These made the aircraft heavier, but the more streamlined, stronger construction allowed the planes to be tougher and capable of greater speed and carrying capacity. Radio communications greatly improved tactical coordination and navigation. Bottled oxygen allowed operation at much higher altitudes. More powerful gun armament built around the much more destructive 20mm automatic cannon gave them a much stronger punch than the old fighters, usually carrying only a pair of light machine guns. Their engines were not only more powerful and reliable, but were equipped with superchargers and drove varial pitch air screws, which meant that they could apply this power much more effectively at different altitudes. The difference between the Mr. Schmidt designs and the PZL fighters, which went out of production just as the BF-109 production began, really shows the rapidity with which aircraft technology was progressing in the 1930s. In terms of first-line fighter strength, the Poles could muster 128 P-11s and 30 P-7s, with perhaps a hundred more of the latter available to be pulled from secondary units such as training formations. The fighter force was organized into two entities. The first was the Pursuit Brigade, a large formation made up of five squadrons flying P-11s and some of the older P-7s, intended for the air defense of the capital. Like the Bomber Brigade, the Pursuit Brigade was directly subordinate to the Commander-in-Chief. The remaining fighter squadrons were attached to the Field Army in units composed of two fighter and two army cooperation slash reconnaissance squadrons. It didn't take a profit to see that war was a strong possibility in 1939, and with more modern fighters unlikely to reach service in any numbers, Poles hit upon two expedients to get some more modern fighters into the air. The first was simply to purchase these planes abroad, and aircraft were ordered or in the process of being ordered from Great Britain, France, Italy, and the USA as war became more and more likely. The other expedient was to proceed with the priority production of the P-11G Kibbutz, which was another incremental advance in the P-11 series. Both these emergency measures managed to deliver a single aircraft apiece by the time of the German invasion. Summer of 1939, the Polish air defense system existed only in the vicinity of Warsaw, and even here it was very rudimentary. Early warning and fighter direction facilities were non-existent, and the general lack of radio capability severely limited the Poles' ability to carry out successful interceptions of intruding aircraft. This state of affairs was made very clear as German reconnaissance aircraft flew preliminary intelligence gathering missions over Polish territory using high-flying Dornier 17s. Though strenuous efforts were made by the Polish fighters to intercept the German intruders, none were to succeed in doing so. Persistent ground fog hung over large areas of Poland on the morning of the first day of the invasion, and this hindered air action in the area's front covered by the Zarstor units of ZG-1 and LG-1 and so these units met with little opposition on the morning of the first day. Conditions were more favorable for air operations toward the south, however, and as their stores of ZG-76 would be in battle with their opposite numbers on the Polish side this day. 
first encounter between 110s and Polish fighters came in the afternoon of the 2nd, with 110s of ZG-76 taking first blood. Two squadrons took part in a fighter sweep operation near Lodz, where they ran into a formation of six Polish flying P-11Cs. This was the first air-to-air -air action for the new heavy fighters, and in it they brought down two of their enemy. The Molinos didn't have it all their own way, however, and three of their own number were lost in the course of that day's operations. Some pilots, who were later to rise to prominent rank among the Luftwaffe's top-scoring aces, were involved in this first skirmish with the Poles. One of the pilots who scored in this action was Lieutenant Helmut Lent. He'd be the first of many future Luftwaffe aces who would score their first victory flying for ZG-76. Lent, and another 110 ace, Helmut Wolfersdorf, fly the plane throughout the war and achieve remarkable success later over Germany as part of the night fighter arm. Another ZG-76 pilot, the Austrian Gordon Golub, will go on to be the first Luftwaffe pilot to score 150 victories. Like many such aces, he scored his first kill in the twin-engine machine. Altogether, the 110 equipped group serving with ZG-76 would account for 19 Polish aircraft confirmed shot down. Further north, the first group of ZG-1 flew 35 sorties on the first day without incident. They took their first loss the next day, when the commander of their third squadron was shot down by a pole flying a P-11. This group was one of the first units created for the new Luftwaffe, and had been the first to adopt the BF-109. It was re-equipped with 110s only in the spring of 1939, and of its three squadrons, one was still using the underpowered B model. After the Polish corridor was secured, this group rebased to East Prussia, where they were normally tasked with escorting Stuka missions to Warsaw. In action over the city during one of these raids, the group would lose another Staffel commander, this time Spanish Civil War veteran Martin Lulz. The first group of ZG-1 proved to be the lowest performing of the 110 groups in Poland, achieving only six victories in this short campaign. Likely, the presence of a large proportion of underperforming B-model 110s contributed to this comparatively poor showing. Two of the group's kills were the work of Walter Errol, the officer who had taken over for the fallen commander of the 3rd Squadron. Like many other early wars their store aces, he would go on to later achieve greater distinction as a night fighter ace. The 3rd 110 group, flying with Lergeschwader, was based in East Prussia at the outbreak of the war. This unit, which had worked before the war to develop the tactics and operational doctrine of the heavy fighter units, would go on to become the highest performing 110 unit of the Polish campaign. The pilots of 1Z LG1 would go on to rack up 30 confirmed kills, most of these against Polish fighters opposing raids on Warsaw. Despite the ground fog that interfered with operations on the first day and kept other units on the ground, the bombers and the escorting their stores the Lergeschwader would be up against the fighters of the Pursuit Brigade throughout the day as they carried out raids on airfields in the vicinity of the capital. Two P-7s were claimed by the 110s in the morning action, and more would be done in subsequent attacks in the afternoon. The first day saw what was probably the fiercest air-to-air -air battles of the campaign. Germans accounted for at least 12 enemy fighters over Warsaw, or at least that is how many of the Pursuit Brigade reported as lost. The Pursuit Brigade claimed 14 German planes of all kinds shot down. The fighter squadron serving in the army formations added another 11 on this opening day. This would be by far the highest scoring day for the Poles, as their air force was rapidly ground down and soon unable to mount serious resistance anywhere outside the Warsaw area. Polish fighter force as a whole was able to offer more or less organized resistance for about a week, though after the 3rd of September, a rapidly increasing amount of chaos disrupted its operations as airfields and supplies were cut off or overrun. More and more the Poles were operating from improvised landing strips and unable to obtain spares and consumable supplies. After the first 10 days, what Poles that would appear in the air would be single planes or small groups, operating on their own initiative, under no central direction, and under purely local command. In the course of the campaign, the pursuit brigades around Warsaw claimed 35 Germans shot down, and the fighters attached to the army added another 51. Most of these were slower types, such as reconnaissance planes and bombers. After the first week, the 110 units throughout Poland found little opposition in the air and were reassigned from bomber escort duties to ground attack missions in support of the advancing ground troops. Though some 110 pilots disliked this kind of work, the aircraft proved well suited to the task, and in this and subsequent campaigns, it was found to be the natural employment of those air stores once they had achieved their original objective of eliminating enemy resistance in the air. Typical of the kind of engagements that the 110s were flying in these first days of the war was that flown by their stores of Lergeschwader on the 3rd of September. Escorting HE-111 bombers in a raid over Warsaw, the 110s were met by a formation of more than 30 PZL fighters. Using the tactics of superior speed, the 110s dived from a higher altitude through the Polish formation and scattered their fighters. 
in a savage, confused combat which ensued, the Germans shot down five of the Poles with the loss of only one of their number. Specific tactics were applied, which had been worked out in pre-war exercises by the Zerstor Swadens of the Lagerschwader. These included a decoying gambit in which one or a pair of fighters would fly alone and appear lost or in difficulty. Their shores would follow a good distance behind and attack the enemy defenses, which had been tempted into attacking an apparently easy target and thereby revealing themselves, either by strafing flak positions or by engaging enemy fighters as they rose to pursue the bait. In defense, the Pomonos used a tactic which would come to typify their daylight operations, the defensive circle. Their stores would follow each other in rings around the sky, making it all but impossible for an enemy fighter to get on the tail of one without putting itself right before the guns of the next in the circle. By the end of the first ten days, the back of the Polish Air Force had been broken, and their fighter arm destroyed as a coherent force. Luftwaffe aircraft flew almost completely unchallenged in Polish skies, and this lack of enemy air opposition in the latter half of the campaign also explains the rather low numbers of air-to-air -air victories claimed by the Zerstorer pilots in the fighting. German pilots were really only encountering the enemy in the air, and only scoring victories in any significant numbers for the first few days. The lack of much air opposition led to a shift in the employment of the BF Womanos towards ground attack and close support missions. In low-level strafing attacks, the Womano could be devastating. The concentrated, heavy firepower of their nose armament was sufficient to defeat most of the armored vehicles they may encounter at this stage of the war, and their speed, ruggedness, and comparative maneuverability made them an excellent choice for a low-level attack plane. It was in Polish skies that the Zerstores would first discover a mission which would become a specialty in the first years of the war, train busting. On one such mission, a 110 crew nearly fell victim to another kind of case of mistaken identity involving Polish aircraft, this time on their own part. A 110, flown by future ace Lieutenant Werner Methpessel, was following the rail line running between Bialystok and Warsaw. Ahead of him, also following the line, was what appeared to be a single Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. As the 110 passed underneath the slower machine, Methpessel caught sight of the large radial engine at the nose of the plane and the large red and white checkerboards on the wings. It was a PZL-23 Karras light bomber, and he had just flown the 110 into a perfect position dead ahead for the Polish aircraft to rake his aircraft with his forward-mounted machine gun. Only a split-second reaction allowed him to push his plane even lower, turn off to starboard, a maneuver which apparently prevented the Polish pilot from noticing him. As the bomber continued along the railway line, even when the 110's rear gunner opened up on the Polish machine, and continued unperturbed along the line, a meth vessel was able to throttle back and slow his heavy fighter down, then curve back behind his enemy unnoticed and bring him down with two short bursts from less than 50 meters range. This would be one of four victories he would score in the course of the fighting in Poland. Purpose-built fighter-bomber versions of the 110, equipped with bomber release gear for a modest on fuselage payload, would be created in order to increase the aircraft's capability in this role. The first of these, the 110C4-B, would appear in the summer of the following year, with the more capable C-7 variant coming into use not long after. This secondary ground attack role would be used again and again in the early campaigns of the war, as the primary employment of the 110 after the elimination of the enemy in the air. A closely related mission, that of maritime reconnaissance slash anti-shipping strike plane, would prove no less suited to the capabilities of the versatile twin-engine machine. The BF 110's performance in the Polish campaign was judged a success, and the expansion of 110 production and of the Zerstorer arm would continue afterward, through the uneasy period of hesitation in late 1939 early 1940 known as the Phony War. BF 110C production, now fully established, went forward at an accelerated pace. More and more Zerstorer squadrons exchanged their BF 109Ds for the sleek new twin engine machine. And that is where I'm going to end this episode. And that's the story of the 110 and the Polish campaign. I hope you found some of this interesting and useful. Next time, we'll continue with this series by looking at another campaign in which the 110 played a prominent role, namely the Western Campaigns of 1940, in which the Germans attacked Denmark, Norway, France, and finally Britain. Till then, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.